All right, welcome to a special fifth episode of Friends of Aquinas, where we will enjoy the company of two excellent guests, Dr. E. Michael Jones and His Excellency Bishop Williamson. Now, Your Excellency, the last time you were here, the audience found you invaluable, your insight into Catholic history. So I th thank you for joining me once again. Please, pleasure. Uh, Dr. Jones, during our first interview, you spoke on a variety of topics from the problem of the white man to the value of proper art and aesthetics, which the audience and I enjoyed immensely. So it is my pleasure to say welcome to you for the second time. Thank you. Good to be here. So let us begin. I know the, the time is somewhat short. Dr. Jones will be leaving, uh, leaving us a bit early. So let's go straight to the topic um, you, Dr. Jones, suggested we discuss off-air, uh, where we can go on tangents from there on, which is the claim that the SSPX and kind of the Holocaust affair struck the final blow to Benedict the Sixteenth, forcing him to resign. So would you like to give us, the uh, audience, the background uh, on this and, and go from there? Yeah, well, well, uh uh, basically, we're talking about a period of uh, uh, the unprecedented influence of social engineering on Germany that no one had ever, uh, no na conquered nation had ever been subjected to this type of uh, regimen of brainwashing uh, that the German people have been subjected to during this period of time. Uh, the vengeance uh, was palpable on the uh, the first uh, initial response after Germany was conquered. Uh, on the part of the United States of America it was called the Morgenthau Plan, uh, put into place by the Jewish Secretary of State, uh, Henry Morgenthau Jr., under Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And it was so draconian, the, the purpose of it was to basically starve the German people to death. Uh, this almost happened during the summer of uh, on, I'm sorry, during the winter of 1946-47. It's called Das Hungerjahr in German history. It's still there, even in all the politically correct texts. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the response, the, uh, the, the saving response uh, from the German people came from the Catholic Church. And I'm talking in particular, the only man who stood up to defend uh, the German people at this time was Cardinal Frings of Cologne who told the people basically that uh, if, if there's a warehouse down the street that has food, um, take the food. It's not theft. Same thing with coal. And that got them through that winter. And uh, Frings stood up to the Allies, and eventually the Allies had second thoughts. Uh, people like Herbert Hoover was calling the Morgenthau Plan Semitic vengeance against the German people, and it was replaced by the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan well, sent money to Germany, but it became a more subtle form of uh, oppression, and that was the social engineering that I mentioned. One of the main uh, vehicles of social engineering was uh, the sexualization of the culture, specifically the spread of pornography. The Allies brought pornography into Germany during this period of time. And once again, the man of the hour was Cardinal Frings. There was a German organization called the Volkswagenbund. Uh, equivalent to the American Legion of Decency, which basically fought obscenity from the late 19th century. And Frings joined forces with them, and they went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Allied forces who were determined to impose uh, pornography and sexual liberation on the German people as a way of making sure they stayed conquered and docile. Okay, during this period of time, a young man, he's 20 years old, at, and during the Hunger Yard, 20 years old in 1947, it's Joseph Ratzinger who becomes uh, the das Wunderkind of the Catholic Church during this time. Everybody thinks he's a brilliant man. In 1959, uh, he's transferred to Bonn, and Bonn is a little bit south of Cologne, and at that point, he meets Cardinal Frings. And Cardinal Frings uh, tells him, uh, there's going to be a council uh, in Rome. I'd like you to come with me. And Ratzinger agreed, and this is uh, the beginning of their relationship. He goes down, he becomes a peritus uh, at Rome. And now we have a collaboration. Now, what does Ratzinger bring to the table? Well, first of all, when he gets to Rome, he's confronted by the preliminary documents, which were written by Cardinal Ottaviani. Uh, in his book, Zeval's biography, he talks about it clearly. Uh, he talks about it in his own memoir. He said that this had to go. This is too negative. It was too reminiscent of the the uh, uh, modern anti-modernist uh, uh, oath of Pius X, of the syllabus of errors, Pius IX. We need a positive approach. We don't want to be uh, burdened by uh, history. 
Well, at this point, it becomes clear that Ratzinger has been influenced by the social engineering of the German people. He feels guilt, I think, a collective guilt, uh, because uh, that's what the Holocaust is there to do. It's a narrative that is supposed to impose guilt on the German people. So he succeeds in uh, getting rid of the preliminary documents, and then we have the new documents come in, and Gaudi Mitzbez says that the church has nothing to fear from the modern world. This, uh, what I'm saying here, I'm proposing here, is that at this point, at Vatican II, through Nostra Aetate, for example, uh, the Holocaust narrative was imposed on the Catholic Church. And as a result, the Church was helpless, completely helpless in dealing with moral issues uh, like Hollywood's subversion of the morals in the United States, because it was uh, Jews who ran Hollywood, and Jews were now our friends, and the Church was now saying that uh, the church is opposed to all forms of anti-Semitism. That's in Nostra Aetate with ever, without ever defining uh, what anti-Semitism means. So 1965, 64, uh, the, uh, 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 the, the Swedes get together, Ingmar Bergman and a Jew named Harry Schein get together, and they uh, spring a movie called The Silence, Tisnaden in uh, the Schweigen in German, and break the code basically in Germany. They break, they, they violate all of the obscenity laws uh, in Germany. They're a dead letter. And at this point, the Catholic Church in Germany abandons the Volkswagenbund, abandons its own lesion of decency. One year later, the same thing happened in the United States of America uh, with a movie called The Pawn Broker, uh, which is a Holocaust movie. The Catholic Church, it's a Holocaust movie. We've just passed Nostra Aetate. I don't know what to do. And so they broke the code in America. At this point, the Jews had free reign to take over the mind of, of Germany and the United States. And that's precisely what happened with catastrophic consequences for faith and morals uh, up to this day. Now, the man who should have done something about this was Joseph Ratzinger. Uh, I, uh, Cardinal George told a friend of mine that basically uh, just as John Paul II was brought in uh, as pope to deal with the Polish question, which was the question of communism, Joseph Ratzinger was brought in to deal with the German question, which is basically the Holocaust, guilt, and so on and so forth. Okay, so just as John Paul II gave that famous ma said mass 1979 in June, to one million people and started the ball in Warsaw, started the ball rolling toward the abolition of communism. Ratzinger went to Munich uh, one year after being elected pope and gave a speech on Muslims. Wait a minute, that's not the speech. That's not the burning issue in Germany. There's another group of people that is the burning issue. He didn't do it. And as a result, this came this, meaning the Holocaust, came and back to bite him, and it destroyed the papacy. And the, our, our uh, other our illustrious guest here, Bishop Williamson, had a crucial role in that regard because of what has come to be known as the, uh, whole, uh, the uh, Williamson affair, which is basically uh, Bishop Williamson got lured into a trap in Bavaria. Uh, by a Swedish film team who, this is what he told me, uh, they had bis bis interviewed him with uh, a lot of insignificant questions. They were packing up, ready to go home, and then the announcer says, oh, by the way, what do you think about the Holocaust? Now, this was a crucial moment because every headline in the world, beginning in Germany, said, Pope allows Holocaust denier into the church. That was the attack, and the church stood there like a deer in the headlights and didn't know what to say. First of all, what is a Holocaust denier? This was a term that was invented by uh, a lady named Debbie Lip Lipstadt in Atlanta uh, in 1993. It is not a category of reality, it's a category of the mind. But because the church could not deal with this, because Ratzinger was Pope, he's a German, he had been subjected to that social engineering, all of this baggage, uh, that wrecked the papacy of Pope Benedict the 16th. And the wreck of that papacy led to the current situation with Pope Francis.
Okay, that's my thesis. I hope this will lead to some type of fruitful discussion. <laughs> well, uh, what frightens, what sort of now frightens me about the Holocaust question, whenever it comes up, nobody, practically nobody, seems to want to go into the question, is it true, is, is what the Holocaust is meant to represent, is it what it's meant to stand for, is what it means, is it true or not? Is it historically true or was it not historically true? Nobody goes into that question. And that is what you say is very true. If the church, if the Catholic church refuses to take stand on truth, it's powerless. Truth is the great power of the church. It's its great strength. And if the church says we don't want, we, we don't want to know the truth, we aren't interested in the truth, forget about the truth, the historical truth, the reality truth, then the church is destroying itself. The church is committing suicide, which corresponds, yeah. to, or corresponds to what you say. You, right. you, you're filling in a lot of interesting details, but essentially uh, uh, what you say is true. Namely, the church is, is refusing to stand on truth. And then the other thing, that, the other fatal thing, of course, is that a lot of Catholics come to the point of saying, oh, they, that's not our fight. We're spiritual. We're not historic. We're not into history. We're not into the past. We're not into politics. We're into spirituality. And that's another deadly, deadly recipe for the church. It's a deadly stand for the church to take. The church can't take that stand. History is the church's business. The, right. the, 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 the reality of what mankind is doing what it thinks it's doing, what it means to be doing, and what it does in history is very much the church's business. It's Almighty God's business. It's the business of the Ten Commandments. It's the business of the church. And for the church to say we're not interested in politics is deadly. Right. We're not interested in truth. We're not interested in politics. We're not interested in the truth in politics is fatal for the church. But the church was going soft. No, I... I, I, I agree. I agree. I, the first time I met Ratzinger was in Philadelphia, and uh, he was Cardinal Ratzinger at that point. And uh, he gave a speech in which the gist of the speech was, are you willing to suffer for the truth? That, that was the gist of his speech. Well, I felt like asking him, are, are you willing to suffer for the truth? Because he had a moment. It went, went at the beginning of his papacy, when he went to Munich, it was two million people showed up. A million people, two million people. The thing in Cologne was two million and so on and so forth. He had a moment. He had the world's attention at that point. And at that point, he should have addressed the Holocaust because that is the fundamental German issue. And his first responsibility is to the German people, just as Pope John Paul II's first responsibility was to the Polish people. Now, if he had said something, if what you're saying, if he had said what you were saying and said, well, it, it, it's this is not true and therefore it has no hold on your conscience, he would have broken the law in Germany at that point. And that would have been the best thing that ever happened to the church. Because at that point, at that point, then the German government is thinking, well, do we arrest the pope? That, that's an interesting kill mange le pape, il meurt. The, the man who eats the pope dies. Uh, they, uh, OK, are we going to arrest the pope? OK, or are we just going to let this whole uh, let's be specific. Paragraph uh, 130, I believe, against Volksverhetzung, against racial incitement. So that becomes a dead letter if we don't prosecute the pope. This would have put the German government in a complete dilemma and would have been a win win situation for the church. But he couldn't do it. Because he had, he had internalized the commands of his oppressors. Yes, that's correct. I think that's entirely correct. And he wasn't the only one, obviously. But it's a whole process of liberalism and, and the, the, the softening, the mushing of people's minds. And Hegel had a lot to do with that. So, and, and I think Ratzinger, I forget the name of the theologian, but a, th a theologian whose first time I think was Joseph, the early 19th century in Germany, I think. And the family name may have gone by the D. But there was a, phil a, a, a philosopher, a, a theologian, a German theologian of, of that era, era, a Hegelian, a follower of Hegel, who had a great influence on Ratzinger's thinking. And um, Ratzinger was a Hegelian, basically. Is, in other well, words, 
there there was there was a there was a German a Catholic uh, what should you say a Catholic uh, following of the uh, German idealists more more following Schelling than than uh, Hegel, uh, but it was it was repu- it was shut down. Uh, Cloyd can just shut it down. The 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 circle around uh, um, Leo the Thirteenth. Uh, when he was, I forget his Italian name, but uh, that they they created uh, Civiltà Cattolica under Pius the Ninth, and that dealt with the world the world situation. And uh, when Leo the Thirteenth uh, became uh, Pope, uh, he was a Thomist, and this was the flowering of the Neo Thomist movement. And he passed uh, Eterni Patris, which made uh, uh, Thomism normative in every Catholic university throughout the world, uh, including Notre Dame. Notre Dame adopted this in 1953. It was the great flowering of Thomism uh, in, in, in Europe. Yeah. And uh, Ratzinger wasn't part of it. Ratzinger said in his memoir, I don't like, he didn't like Thomas Aquinas. That's he right. liked, he liked Augustine much better. And there was a, an anti-Thomist reaction at Vatican II. There's no question about it. And I think that the, the main, I mean, let's be honest here. I think there's a flaw in Thomism. And the fact is it's based on Aristotle and Aristotle uh, doesn't have history. There's no history here. And you've got a, a religion that is based on a, his, a historical narrative, Christianity. And so there's a conflict here that had to be resolved. I think it could have been resolved. Uh, but what you had at, at, um, at this moment in places like Notre Dame was a kind of ahistorical Thomism. And all these people, the, the reaction was building, and it came out in Vatican II. It was, in many ways, a repudiation of Thomism. If you repudiate Thomism, you repudiate certainty. And once you do that, then you're you're on uncharted waters. Yes, yes. There's there's something I would say. There's something in what you say, but I can't agree entirely because um, uh, Aristotle is a historical. Yes, he's abstract. He's thinking abstractly, but he's thinking reality. It's pure, but it's pure common sense. And St. Thomas Aquinas didn't have to change much in Aristotle. And, and it's true, the, the Summa Theologia is also a historical. It's, it abstracts from history, but uh, it's the very marrow and, and essence of history, the reality which it analyzes in its abstract way. The, 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 St. Thomas and Aristotle is the very essen, essence of, the, of, the, of reality. So I don't think you can blame Aristotle. I don't think you can blame St. Thomas Aquinas. What you can blame is a whole culture which has been going liberal uh, in Europe ever since the French Revolution. The liberalism conquered with liberty, equality, fraternity, uh, and uh, liberalism was undermining the whole of the, steadily undermining the whole of the 19th century. Germanic form, Hegel, especially through Hegel, after Kant. Uh, Pius X names Kant. Well, he doesn't name him actually, but he quotes a vital principle of Kant as being the very essence of modernism in his, in his encyclical Pascendi. And that, I think, is where the, the problem is. It's an abstract problem because Kant is also working in the abstract. It's not, but it, the abstract works out in history, which is why it can seem as though abstract philosophers and theologians are, are ahistorical, but they are, the good ones go to the very essence of reality, whereas the bad ones, like Hegel and Kant, go to some dreamland of, uh, of contradiction in which, you know, contra- co- contradiction, things contradict you, don't exclude one another. It's a complete uh, undoing of the mind, a mushing of the mind, which results in Vatican II. Yeah, I, uh, there was uh, a struggle here. Uh, I think that uh, Ratzinger kind of solved the problem, at least in his own mind, by uh, distinguishing uh, the American Revolution from the French Revolution. Oh. He, gave, he gave a speech you know, uh, right before he was elected Pope to the Curia about what it was like to be uh, in Rome during the Second Vatican Council. And he said, uh, we understood that there was a good enlightenment and the good enlightenment was America. Uh, and, and America, uh, they, you know, God bless America, that's all I can say. But uh, uh, if you're talking about Thomas Jefferson, uh, he was every bit as 
uh, against religion as as the philosophes. But anyway, th this is what Ratzinger actually said, whether whether we agree with it or not. And I think that uh, that's what led Time magazine to call uh, call Ratzinger the the first American pope. He was clearly on the side of the Americans because I think he felt that America allowed the church to make peace with the Enlightenment. I think that was that was the role that America played. Uh, and I think that's what uh, guided the church during this period of time. It was the American empire. Let's face it. It was the American empire because at that point, the early point, or certainly at the time of Vatican II, they, they were engaged in a fight against communism. And we all hated communism. So therefore, whatever they did was good. It was a completely naive understanding of America, a completely, mi uh, completely missed the boat. And at the same time, they're fighting communism. They are destroying Catholic culture throughout Europe. This was in Ottaviani's document. To Ottaviani said there's a problem. He says a problem with communism, but there's a problem with Hollywood and psychoanalysis. Yep. Well, who are they? What what group of people is involved in Hollywood and psychoanalysis? It was a uh, a veiled reference to the Jews, certainly a reference to America, but a veiled reference to the Jews. And at that point, no, no, we don't want to go there. I think that this was the dynamic of Vatican II. It was basically the Holocaust narrative haunting the entire council with Ratzinger using Frings as his mouthpiece to basically uh, bring about a new era of reconciliation with the Enlightenment. I think that's true. The, reconcili the reconciliation of um, the godless modern world, because it's liberal, because of the Enlightenment, with, um, with the religion of God. And at Vatican II, the churchmen sided with the, mo the godless modern world against the religion of God, and that was the virtual end of the true religion of God. At that point, I'm going to disagree with you. No, I don't think it was the end of the true religion. Oh, I think that the, the yeah. I think the struggle is still continuing to this oh, day. Yes, of course it is. No, I don't, don't. I don't take it to mean that I think you know the church is is going to come to an end. No way. But what I mean is. It was for purposes of, of, of the minds of the mass of people, it was the justification of the apostasy. Let's put it that way. And for the minds of, unfortunately, far too many of the churchmen, it was the end of the church. The church was finished. The true church was finished in the minds of a lot of churchmen at Vatican II. But of course, the true church wasn't finished. No, I completely agree with you there. Oh, yes, that, that's, that's, that's not <laughs> what I mean. Right. And it, it got stronger because you had the collaboration between uh, John Paul II and the Reagan administration as the culmination of the anti-communist crusade. And yeah. I, I was just getting started as a, a young editor of a magazine at that point. And yeah. I remember those days, you know, like Wordsworth talking about, twas, twas bliss to be alive then, you know, it was all of the stars were in alignment, church and state completely united in the fight against communism, and it turned out to be successful. Uh, and the problem is uh, the successes uh, that you have like this. It cemented the idea in the minds of Catholics that America, what, what, what America was the, was, was the church in action? <laughs> is, this, is this what it was? America is the church in action or something like that in the minds of Catholics throughout the world. And they still, they still haven't gotten, well, I guess they're getting over it now. I mean, with the Biden administration and that train wreck. But I mean, this was the, the, this was the, the central myth of my youth as, as a young man. Yes. Yes. No, liberalism prepares, makes the bed for communism, prepares, it prepares communism. So if, if a liberal state is pretending to be anti-communist, uh, it, uh, it's, it's either not true to the liberal state or it's completely misunderstanding what communism is. Because liberalism and communism are on the same wrong side of um, the fight for or against God. Liberalism is against God and communism is against God. The idea that liberalism can be at for God is an accident. It's it's not of the essence of liberalism. Liberalism is deadly. You you can find this certainly in Pius the Ninth. You can find it in Leo the Thirteenth, where he says, "I think that capitalism is is the father of socialism, and then it's the grandfather of Bolshevism." Yes. 
Uh, I, I, that's, that's clear. But now we're not talking that this isn't the language we are using in, in this in the 1960s. We have uh, John Courtney Murray dominated uh, Vatican II in some sense or another, certainly with their church and state issue. John Courtney Murray, as we have pointed out, uh, was uh, working with the CIA at this point. There were there were two groups that were trying to subvert the Second Vatican Council. The CIA was working with John Courtney Murray through Time Life. Time Life, uh, Time Magazine was the, the propaganda ministry of uh, the, the CIA. Uh, the man who was con- working bo- both sides was a man by the name of C.D. Jackson, a Jew who had grown up in propaganda during World War II. And the other group was was the Jews, and they were working. B'nai B'rith and uh, the American, uh, American Jewish Committee were using Father Malachi Martin as their agent uh, to basically get Nostra Aetate to declare that the Jews were not guilty uh, for the death of Christ. That was their goal. They didn't get it. Uh, but it doesn't change the fact that those two powerful groups were working to undermine the church. Now, I, I am going to say here that they did not succeed. OK, I am going to say that uh, I will con- I will concede uh, Nostra Aetate. I, I, de- I read the documents. I read the back and forth. Mr. Schuster was very unhappy because they didn't get uh, an exoneration for killing Christ. But they did put something in there. They said the church opposes all forms of anti-Semitism. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean everything the ADL says is now dogma in the church? Well, it is. That is de facto the case. And that is the fundamental problem with, with the church right now. It has internalized the commands of its oppressors. Traditionally, who were the oppressors of the Christians? It was the Jews. Read. I don't have to tell you to read the Acts of the Apostles. But I mean, that's the story is right there. Sure, absolutely. No, that is they. It's those people, the awkward people, the WKW. We know who. It's those people that have been the steady and constant enemies of Christ. They hate him because he took away all their privileges. Uh, the, he 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 replaced Christ was responsible for changing the people of God from a people of, by, of God by race to a people of God by faith. And that took away from the the Jews their special position, and um, they've hated Christ for it ever since. And their pride is is deeply hurt by the by Christ, uh, by his humiliating of them, by his taking away from them of their special status as the people of God, and opening it up to to the Gentiles. That's what's in the Act of the Apostles, and that's what's in the teaching of Saint Paul. There are a lot of quotes by St. Paul, which are word, the word of God in his epistles about the Jews, because the Jews were a very special problem of the church from the very beginning, and it's they who are behind communism, they who are behind Freemasonry, and they who are behind Vatican II, and they who are now behind the Ukraine war. It's right. always them. Right. You're right. I, I, I asked a graduate student in theology at Notre Dame, I asked her, uh, who said... Uh, the Jews are the people that kill Christ and are enemies of the entire human race. And she said, without missing a beat, Adolf Hitler. I said, well, no, no, that was uh, St. Paul in, in 1 Thessalonians 2. That's now, right. if, if a graduate student in theology, I mean, I'm not, it's Notre Dame, admittedly, but I mean, a graduate student in theology thinks this, it shows you how deeply the church has internalized the Holocaust narrative. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. And the Holocaust is the, is the concrete. It, the Holocaust is not at all abstract. The Holocaust is heaps of shoes, heaps of spectacles, a particular kind of gas. Uh, it, it's very concrete. The Hebrews have a gift for concreteness. Uh, and this very concrete story, they have a gift for propaganda. They have a gift for uh, isolating a particular person who concretizes the, their, the abstract problem for them. And they, they, they pin it on a person, which is a elementary propaganda technique. But they, the Jews know it, and the rest of the world behaves as though it doesn't know it. That's right. That's right. There is, I, just to say a good word for Hegel, uh, he came up with a concept called uh, die List der Vernunft, or the cunning of reason, which I think is a powerful concept. And I think we're witnessing that today, today, as, as we speak. 
Now, so, dealistic vernunft is not the, 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 the cunning of, of religion, it's the cunning, cunning of reason. Of, I said yeah. the I said the cunning of reason. If I said yeah. religion, I misspoke. Vernunft is reason, or logos. It's his word for logos. Yes. So we have a situation right now. Well, the United States Supreme Court has overturned Roe versus Wade. This yes. now uh, this caused a huge uproar, media incited uproar, just of the kind that you experienced. Uh, and now something totally new has emerged. The Jews are now saying abortion is a fundamental Jewish value. Yeah, completely out of the blue. They never said this before. And then they go on to say, if you prohibit abortion, you will prevent Jews from practicing their religion. And then they take it one step further. This is chutzpah. They always push it too far. Being being anti-abortion means being anti-Semitic. Yep. Now, how, how is the church going to deal with this? The church opposes all forms of anti-Semitism. So now the church must support abortion. Yeah, this, is, this is the logical outcome of Catholic Jewish dialogue over the past 50 years. Absolutely. We now have to support abortion. Otherwise, we're not good Catholics because we're anti-Semitic. You've got it. I think you're absolutely right. Yes, it's, it's insane for any, any sane mind, any sane Catholic. For somebody to declare that, that um, abortion is a right of theirs is absolutely to discredit whoever those people are. They're going slap up, once again, go to the truth of the matter, they're going slap up against God's sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. And they're violating directly one of the Ten Commandments. Uh, how can a Catholic, how can a sane Catholic think anything but, but bad of such people? They're... they're, they're they're, they're tipping their hand when they say that when you, as I'm sure you, you know, as you quote them saying, when they say uh, abortion is a Jewish right, they're, they're, they're tipping their hand. They're showing that they're satanic. This, they, you're right. There are certain theological conclusions that we have to draw from this. So who, what is this religion? Is it the religion of Moses? Is this the religion of the Torah or is it the religion of the other Hebrews? Remember the other Hebrews? They worship Moloch. Exactly. And, and if you worship Moloch, your sacrament is offering your child up and child sacrifice to this God. Well, th th then who, who has the church been dialoguing with all these years? This, this is, this is uh, 140 Jewish organizations have all come out and said abortion is a fundamental Jewish value. We, we have to draw the conclusion that these people, they're not the children of Moses, they're Moloch worshipers. Absolutely, absolutely. And the church has got to take a stand on God. It's God's sixth commandment that makes abortion evil. Of course, abortion is intrinsically anti-natural against human nature. To, keep, to kill without need is, uh, is, is absolutely against God. So these are enemies of God. If the Jews say that abortion is a Jewish right, the Jews are declaring we are against the one true God. That's what they're saying. That's the theological conclusion to be drawn. If you go into the truth of the matter, like if you go into the truth of the Holocaust, you find it's historically simply not true. All of the arguments against it's only the emo emotions which are for six million people having been killed by a deliberate policy of extermination. But the, uh, uh, the historical arguments are all against six million people having been killed by a deliberate policy of extermination. <clears throat> so these people can't think, they don't think, they emote, they're very clever at exploiting emotion, at arousing emotion, at stirring up emotion by propaganda, by at ex ex exploiting emotion, but they don't think, and anybody who approves of what they're doing doesn't realize what he's saying, and doesn't realize who, who, who all the true God is, and what the one true God stands for. They just don't know God, they don't know our Lord Jesus Christ, they don't know the true religion, they don't know the truth, they don't want to know the truth. All Jews and all Gentiles who think like these Jews, Except, of course, there are always decent Jews, there are decent Jews, but they're not a majority. And as you quoted uh, a little while ago, uh, the second chapter of the first Epistle of Paul's Thessalonians, 
the, these poor people, the awkward people, are enemies of God, enemies of life, and enemies of man. And that's why they love abortion, because abortion is against life, obviously. Abortion is also against the selfish way of, the selfish and sinful. Abortion favors the selfish and sinful way of life of modern man, which is intrinsically a war on God. So people just don't, don't think they don't know. And of course, you breathe a word, one word, against the awkward people, and you just mention the, 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 the Jew word, and it's the most electronic word, elec electrocuting word in, in the vocabulary. That's what they have managed to do. And that's the next most ele electro electrocutory word is anti-Semitic. Once your label is anti-Semitic, oh boy. You've got or everybody's emotions are running against you. Yeah, it's, it's war on God. Right. Modern man is making war and war on, and war on the church. This and is and and, and uh, uh, Peter Zewald, I think, understands this. He understands the fact that uh, the Williamson affair destroyed the papacy of Benedict the Sixteenth because he couldn't articulate. I'm talking about Pope Benedict now could not articulate any of the things that we are talking about right now. Could not articulate it. No. Could not articulate the fact that their Holocaust denial is a completely bogus concept that was made up a few years ago uh, because uh, the trials, uh, the Zundel trials and things like that in Canada exposed the whole uh, hollowness of the Holocaust narrative. It couldn't be defended anymore. It couldn't be defended, and so therefore it had to be made illegal to, to criticize it. Absolutely. And that's the situation. Now, this demands a course correction. We Absolutely. cannot go on in this direction. We Absolutely. cannot let this the Jewish question go unanswered anymore. Exactly. anymore. And I'm saying this is why I brought up Hegel. It was God, through his enemies, who brought the issue to the consciousness of the Catholic Church. We cannot go any farther because if we accept if we accept the situation now, it means that we have to be pro-abortion because if we're not pro-abortion, we are anti-Semitic and we can't be that. It's, it's either one or the other. You can't have it both ways anymore. This is confronting the church with a, an existential crisis right now and they're gonna have to make up their mind. Well, you will be lucky because people will go on reconciling irreconcilables because they want to keep they want to have their cake and eat it. So <laughs> we're not we're not we're not talking about people. We're talking about the church. OK, the church the cannot the de cannot defect uh, when it comes to teaching faith or morals. It cannot be defective in that regard. Because if it were, it wouldn't be the church and the gates of hell would have prevailed against it. Correct. Entirely so, correct. so there has to be a course correction. If there is no course correction, then it's not the church. And then what? And then what? <laughs> if the church isn't the church, well, our Lord says, if, the, uh, if, if, if these children fall silent, it's, in, it's, in, it's, it's approaching Jerusalem for the Passion or just shortly before the, before the, the Holy Week. And the the Pharisees can't you? And the children are all cheering and and uh, greeting the Messiah. And uh, the the, the Pharisees turn to our Lord, can't you shut up, shut these children up? And our Lord replies, if these children were to fall silent, the very stones of the street would cry out. So if Michael, as you say, the churchmen don't change course, Almighty God will raise up children from the stones of the street, and those stones will cry out the truth. The truth will be, continue to be heard, and it will proclaim what you have been saying, namely that these people are enemies of God, which is what St. Paul says, which is what Almighty God says in his word, which is the second epistle, to, the first epistle to the Thessalonians, chapter 2. That's uh, when the Spiegel, the Spiegel was the ringleader in this conspiracy against uh, Benedict the Sixteenth. It's yeah. a li it's a licensed uh, journal. They got a license from a Jew by the name of Morde David Mordecai Levy after World War II, and they have to uh, uh, accept the terms of their license. Okay, but that being said, they had the final word, I think, because they accused 
Ratzinger, after he resigned, the resignation they brought about, after he resigned, they accused him of Fahnenflucht, Fahnenflucht, desertion, desertion, desertion under fire, even though they, they brought it about. And I think they were right. I think they were right because at the beginning of his papacy, he told Zaval, or Zaval quotes in his book, but he said, pray that when the wolves come that I don't flee. Yes. Well, he fled there in an unprecedented fashion. OK, he yes. fled and, and that led directly to the papacy of Francis, which I think everyone concedes is a complete train wreck. Uh, yes. Sad, sad to say so. But. You must be, uh, <laughs> how can I say this? Uh, do you feel vindicated? I mean, do you, I, C.D. Jackson once said that uh, Stalin was the greatest salesman the United States of America had. So I'm going to say Pope Francis is the greatest salesman the SSPX ever had. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if you're up to date on this one, Michael, but the SSPX is also guilty of fan and flu. No, I, I, I know, I, I know there was a, you, you know, a, par, a, a parting of the ways. I know you're not part of it anymore. I'm just trying, I'm trying to talk about the, the broader perspective. This Traditionis Custodis, I think, was calculated to drive Catholics into the SSPX. I think that was the, the, the classic, that, that was the intention behind Father Reese. He was the guy who came up with the idea. It's in America Magazine. Uh, the, I, think that's, I think that's what's going on here. I think that's the dynamic right now. Well, it's it's paracidens. If um, it's only an it's, it's only an accident. If uh, some people think do think that uh, Pope Francis is wanting to drive all the hens into one coop, so that the foxes can then close in on all the remaining hens inside the trapped inside the one coop. That he will he would if he lived long enough smash the SSPX, the, the new SSPX, the neo SSPX, containing all remaining Catholics, because it would be that much easier to smash them if they're all in what are now under one head inside one coop. But um, I don't think that that's the plan of the bad guys. It may well be the plan of the bad guys. But uh, Almighty God remains the master of the game. And I think the answer to your basic concern about the future of the church, if I may put it like that, which is very reasonable, I think the basic answer is Almighty God is going to intervene and he's going to intervene with an absolutely unprecedented chastisement, much worse than the water flood of Noah, a fire flood, which will, uh, Our Lady says, eliminate a large part of mankind, the good with the bad, the priests with the laity, and the survivors will be so desolate that they will envy the dead. I think that's what's in the future. And I think it's out of nothing less than something like that that the church, the true church, can once again flourish. And I think that's when the true church will flourish. But between now and then, the situation is too, is too rotten, it's too far rotten. It's too, the, re, the, the, the rot runs deep. I myself believe, you may, you may well not agree with me, but that's, that's not a mortal sin. <laughs> Venial <laughs> sin, though. <laughs> I think that... Uh, Rats, there's something decent in the man Joseph Ratzinger. There is something decent in him. For instance, his release of the old mass. He meant well. And I think he, do, I think he does mean well. But his mind is messed up. The enemy possesses our minds. I think you would say that. Yeah, he's internalized the commands of his oppressors. He's, yeah. a, victim, he's a victim of American Jewish social engineering yep. uh, uh, as a young man. Yep. I I I'd like to. Uh, we we uh, met in person a few years back yes. came to talk to you at Wimbledon, yes. and um, you mentioned at that time that uh, you had a, a letter on your desk uh, which said, "I accept Vatican II in light of tradition," and yep. and then you spent uh, the next uh, three hours telling me why you couldn't sign that letter, okay. even though you said that. Uh, Archbishop Lefebvre would have signed that letter. Now, do you do you think that, first of all, do you think the situation would be different if you had signed that letter? Yes. Do you think do you think Ratzinger might still be Pope 
if you would sign that letter? Because you've already said, you know, the point is to drive people like you out of the church. It did, I mean, you you know, that that's what I think the strategy was. Do you think uh, had I told you to sign the letter when I walked in the door and you said that I said, well, go up and sign the letter. And we'll talk about tennis or something since we're, since we're at Wimbledon. Uh, do you think you would have the situation would have changed if you had signed that letter? No, no, absolutely not. Uh, it would, might have changed my situation, but um, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, my signing or not signing was not important to the authorities of the SSBX. It wasn't important to Ratzinger. It wasn't important to Rome. It wasn't important to the newspapers. Um, I don't think it would have made any difference. I think, I think you're being far too modest here uh, because the, you had already been uh, turned into a celebrity because of that. I think at this point, uh, Vratzinger could have said that this was a victory. This was a victory because he had healed the schism. Well, I think that might that might have that might have preserved that might have buoyed him up psychologically. Um, it might it might it might have had a positive effect on the church. I don't think so, Michael. I think you're I think you're greatly overrating anything that I might have done. I'm serious. That that's not just modesty. I'm serious because there's a truth. The question is truth. Is it true that um, what, 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 was the, what was the letter going to be about? Is it is if I had said that I accept Vatican II, let's say, does that change Vatican to the nature, the intrinsic nature of Vatican II? Does it change the absolute intrinsic truth of the of the nature of Vatican II? It wouldn't have changed a thing. Now wait, now wait. Let's go back to that one sentence. The church opposes all forms of anti-Semitism. That is a disaster. That has to be clarified. OK, we yeah. cannot mean what the ADL means. Now, uh, that sentence can be interpreted in light of tradition. In other words, the church could say, oh, anti-Semitism, that's racial determinism. We don't believe in that. Anything else is fair game. Anything else. Uh, so we're not accusing Pope. Uh, we're not accusing uh, Jesus Christ of being an anti-Semite because he said your father is Satan to the Jews. Wouldn't that have been an instance where you could have interpreted the Vatican II document in light of tradition? Uh, the, the Vatican II, the, 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 the intrinsic truth, the objective truth about the do these documents of Vatican II is that they are ambiguous. They can be interpreted in line with tradition. They can be interpreted, but they can equally be interpreted out of line with Catholic tradition. So the truth is that these documents are ambiguous. And another truth is that the Catholic Church does not talk ambiguously. The Catholic Church does not play with truth. Ambiguity is, is double talk. And scripture says it's the, in the Psalms, and it's, it's, it's outside of the Psalms as well, that God hates ambiguity. God hates double talk. He hates it. I think it's in Proverbs as well. Um, and that's the objective truth about ambiguity. And that's the final truth about Vatican II. It is ambiguous. And it's because it's ambiguous that it's destroyed the church. Because the good guys, the, the naive guys, the naive good guys can always say, oh, yes, but you can interpret it in line with tradition. Yes, you can. But, but that doesn't justify these ambiguities. The ambiguity is intrinsically hateful to God because of its, its slippery nature, and it's, it's halfway to lies. Ambiguity is not a full-blooded lie. If, if Vatican II had dealt in full-blooded lies, uh, the good guys, would, the, even the naive good guys, would have recognized it straight off, and Vatican II would never have passed. Catholics would never have accepted Vatican II. It's a question of absolute truth and of the, the objective nature of things, and the fact that um, people have lost grip of objective truth. Very few people still believe that there is an objective truth which is independent of Catholic of, of anybody's minds. No, well, I agree with that. I think you're far too modest. I think you. Uh, I think you could have had uh, an impact, uh, and we and together uh, with other people, we could have come up with a course correction, which would have resolved this ambiguity. Ambiguities are there to be resolved. They're not, they're, they don't have the final word unless we lack the courage to re, to resolve them. But anyway, I, I, I'm sorry. I've enjoyed this immensely. 
I wish we could get together more often. Uh, next time you're in the, uh, uh, the area, let me know and we'll get together again. But th thank you for uh, allowing me to have this discussion. I got to get off, got to do something else. Please, please give my respects and my regards to um, uh, Mr. Uh, Amin Haddad. I'm sorry, I can't get the name right. Ahmed I, I will. Please. Okay. So long. Well, oh, thank so you so long. much, Dr. Jones, for coming on. That was an excellent discussion. Uh, stay on for um, uh, that. I'm talking to the audience now. We'll have a two minute break and then we'll be back with uh, Bishop Williamson to discuss this step further. Thank you very thank much, you. Dr. Jones. Thank you. Peace. Peace.
I'll sit here for two weeks and. Uh, All right. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, hopefully, well, that I don't know about you. I, I've seen some very, very good. Let me just fix the cameras whilst I talk here. That was an, a, a very good discussion. Honestly, I think we have one, two of, a, of the best minds to discuss this issue of Vatican II and the Holocaust and, and World War II. It is really kind of a, a really a sad situation of affairs, I would say that, to, to put it mildly, Your Excellency, is it not? And we just spoke off air about, uh, you know, I'm just a, a young Catholic who wants to live a Catholic life, and how am I supposed to do that when there are such glaring contradictions here? And I will just repeat for the sake of the audience so we can start this conversation. Um, so what what Dr. Jones has said right there, he said the church cannot teach error. Okay, let's. I agree with that absolutely. The, the church is infallible, um, as is as is the Pope when he makes solemn statements regarding the uh, regarding uh, faith and morals. And then uh, you have Vatican II, and suddenly now you know the Jews didn't kill Christ. Suddenly now no need to convert Jews, as you've known from the semi recent document. They said there is no mission to convert the Jews. I mean that is uh, that is. You know that that's that's a bit. Uh, uh, let's just say it's new school. Yes. Uh, then there is this uh, modernism thing. Once again, you talked about the abandonment of Thomism. It is a whole new religion, is it not? And yes. uh, how am I as a as a young Catholic who sees this? I can't go to Novus Ordo, and uh, I I can't really go to these like offshoot traditionalist priests because half of them are heretics anyway because they believe that uh, basically outside the church there is salvation, which is I think the most ridiculous thing one has ever said. So they believe in this like Vatican II style. The, the Catholic Church subsists within the Church of God, but outside the Church of God, somehow there is some salvific nature, which I, I completely reject. Uh, uh, and, and so how am I, as a traditionally minded Catholic, to deal with a situation? Okay, um, I'm going to give you my answer. Um, one, number one, pray one five. 15 mysteries of the Holy Rosary every single day, okay? Uh, because that will keep your head above swirling waters of drowning and damnation. That will keep your head above, above the confusion. You will start to... Uh, Our Lady will start to guide your mind and your mind will guide the rest of you, which is what it's designed to do. So, but the rosary will save your mind. Um, it will save your mind from errors on the right or on the left. Scripture says of Moses that he was a man who, or Joshua, I think it is, uh, he was a man who deviated neither to the right nor to the left. That's what we need to do today. Sedevocatism is, in my opinion, is a deviation to the right, whereas Vatican II is a deviation to the left. A savior, state of accounts, in my opinion, is an overreaction to the evil raging inside too many churchmen's heads. Um, evil in the form of an error and ambiguity, which is confusing the churchmen's minds. They need to clean out their minds. And in order to clean out their minds, they need each of them to pray 50 missions a day. When Thomas More was asked, well, why, the, why did the why did England lose the faith? Or some such question. He said, because the bishops weren't praying enough. The mm. bishops, that's where the, that's where the central problem is. And they weren't praying enough. Because life is not black. Black is not white. White is not black. But all around us in real life are mixtures all the time of white with black or black with white. Now, the mixture does not mean that black is white or white is black. But it does mean that in this life, uh, in this poor veil of tears, uh, evil and good are mixed uh, all over the place. So you've got, in my opinion, in the Novus Ordo, you've got a, a measure of evil, a measure of black and a measure of white. There are a number of decent priests still operating as decent priests inside the Novus Ordo. And... Uh, 
many of my colleagues would disagree with that. Uh, they'd be saying, they'll be saying, I'm too kind to the novice order. I would say that as well, for what that's worth. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Because you can have had some very nasty experiences. You've been dragged through a thorn hedge once, and you don't want to be dragged through it a second time. I completely understand, because you lose a lot of your fleece going through the, through the, <laughs> through the thorn hedge. It's a very unpleasant experience. But, you know, that doesn't mean that everything in the novice order is black. So when you say, what am I going to do? And, and here again, a mem a man, I, many of my colleagues could say, I'm being far too soft on the novice order. Okay, 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 I, don't, yeah, I, I deny nobody's right to disagree with what I say. But what I think is happening, I think that for a Catholic like yourself that's looking for the truth, if you look for, if you, I don't know where you're living, I don't know if you're living in a big town or a big city, uh, but if you look for somewhere in your area, within reach of your car's petrol tank, your gasoline tank, uh, you will find somewhere, you'll find a decent novice or priest who is just waiting to hear properly a young man's confession in order to give him back the state of grace, which is his business as a priest. And he knows it. And I don't believe that there are no priests in the novice order, in the novice order church who understand this. I believe there are some who do understand it and who still want to practice as good priests. Now, they're forced to celebrate the new mass. But I think if you look around you enough and long enough and carefully enough, you will even find young novice order priests saying the old mass. More and more of them are being tempted by the old mass, which is why Francis is trying to stamp it out. But it's the last effort. It's too late. He can't do it. Ever since Benedict XVI, for instance, okay, e. Michael Jones, my Dr. Jones, is not too keen on Benedict XVI. Hey, he's right. There's a bunch of garbage inside the head of the poor Hegelian probe. But at the same time, there's some goodwill. I say there's some goodwill. There always has been. And to this day, there, I would say there is some goodwill in the heart of Benedict XVI. His mind is completely messed up. That's his problem. He's a man of mind, and he's a good mind, but it's a mind, it's a decent computer, but the program is rotten. And that's the case, I do think, of a lot of shepherds, a number of shepherds, especially priests in, inside the Novus Order. And I think, if you look, if you keep, keep your standards, don't abandon what you know is truth. Almighty God has given you the grace to see a lot of truth, um, and to see that it is another religion. You're quite right. Is this is a fight to the war to the death between two religions. It's one pope, two religions. Uh, it used to be two popes, one religion, but today... <laughs> <laughs> I think what Jesus said is one pope and two religions. And he's not the only one that said it. I think Madinol said it and the others have said it. Yes. Uh, and it's absolutely true. There are the, the two religions in one side, one head, in, fight one another like two ferrets in a sack. But uh, the two religions are different. You have been given by God the grace to see how false the new religion is. You want to stick to the old religion. God love you. God bless you. Or you're absolutely right. But don't think that there's nothing of the old religion left in any of the Novus Ordo priests or Novus Ordo churches around you. Look carefully. Look gingerly. Don't, don't betray the truth that God has given you to see. But look to see if there isn't somewhere around you, a novice order priest who, some, a, 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 that's it, a priest inside the framework of the novice order who only asks to hear properly a young man's confession, who is longing to do that and who knows it's his function to do that and who only wants to say the true mass. And you will find, I think you will find, if you look, you will, find, you will get onto a network, probably, in your diocese, you, you will find a network of at least a handful of young priests looking to say the old mass. And that's why Francis was losing his mind in trying to stamp it all out. It's too late. People have, a lot of people in the, in the false church have run into the true church, like yourself, they've run into the true church. It does still exist, true priests with true do doctrine in their heads and true desires in their hearts of getting to heaven and of helping, helping souls to get to heaven making it possible for souls to get to heaven.
Because without the priesthood, there's no, it's very difficult for anybody to get help. Very difficult. And Your Excellency, it's interesting that you say that because it opens a whole can of worms. Because I, I'm not convinced that the Novus Ordo ordinations are even valid. So, you know, when, uh, with all due respect, Your Excellency, you, you, you're asking me to go and sift through all these Novus Ordo priests. Uh, I'm sitting there like, well, they've pretty much, it's, it's, you could say it's dubious. I'll even, I'll even, you know, concede that. But I, I can't, in my good conscience, go and participate in what is potentially idolatry. I just cannot do that. And 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 surely, fair uh, enough, understood. Go on. And, and surely, and this is ultimately why I can't even face pretty much a Novus Ordo priest because I just remember Pope Pius the Twelfth, and many, many, of course, have spoken on this. Um. On what is Catholicism? What does it mean to be Catholic? And and let me just quote a Mystici Corpus, um, and I quote Pope Pius the Twelfth: Actually, only those are to be numbered amongst the members of the Church who have received the lava of regeneration and profess the true faith. And this has been this has been said by many other uh, by many other popes that the 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 faith needs to be held inviolate. It, that means every dogma, that means every single dot and a dot above the eye, everything. Hey, hey, yes, go on. One moment. One moment. They, it's tr objectively, that's looks true. But the world at the time, at the time of these people writing, these good churchmen saying these good and true things, then there was not the, sub the raging subjectivism which you've got today. Then people learned at school that two and two are four. They, they learned that they can't be five, they can't be six, they can't be six million. Uh, they can only be four. Mm. Neither 4.01 nor 3.99. Not possible. 4.00 and ending series of zeros. That's the only thing that two and two can be. But that's no longer taught. In, what the children learn in school in mathematics is, or what they learn with Venn diagrams is Euclidean geometry is not the only possible geometry. It is the only possible geometry to, to correspond to reality. People, the, the children in school and the professors in the university are all into a world of flex of rubber truth. Truth is, is no longer absolute and exclusive of error. There's no such thing as error any longer. How do you think, if when, when you've been born and bred with that that refusal of objective truth. How can you think even a soul of goodwill can understand dogma? How can there be a real God when there's no reality? How can there be a true God when there's no truth? Truth and reality have been completely undermined by Hegelian philosophy. You, you, it's a lot more than just Hegel, but it's a philosophy of a war on God and a war on truth and a war on reality. And when somebody is born and bred in that world, with his parents going along with that, with his teachers going along with that, with his universities going along with that, with his priests and bishops and popes going along with that, how do you think these poor souls can have any inkling of dogma? So if they don't profess absolutely objective dogma, which is you quite rightly say they should be doing and they have to do, but if they don't know, how can they profess what they don't know? what they've never known, what they've never been taught. Modern education is a disaster. The criminals, uh, the, the anti-God criminals have succeeded, the awkward people have succeeded in infiltrating the universities. They've infiltrated medicine. They've infiltrated the law. They've infiltrated politics. They've infiltrated the church, the church itself, the church of truth, the salt of the earth and the light of the world is infiltrated. Whose fault was that? They, whoever it was, they bear a tremendous responsibility if they knew what they were doing. But don't you, do, wouldn't you agree that a lot of those, after that first generation of real criminals who knew exactly what they were doing, there's a number of innocent souls following error without knowing that it's error and with hardly the means. I say hardly. God knows. God judges. God is not fooled. So if, if they go along with the error, knowing it's error, they take part in the responsibility. But there's a lot going along with the error who don't, who don't understand. A lot of your young novice order priests have never known tradition. They've never known it even existed. 
at some point in their life, Almighty God may well bring it across their horizon, bring it to their attention, bring it to their knowledge, then they respond. Am I interested in this? Does this appeal to me? Or do I want nothing to do with this? I suspect this is going to condemn everything I've ever stood for, and it's going to make life very uncomfortable for me and very difficult. No, I don't want to know. Okay, I don't want to know. I shut down. They're out of, they're out of, the, they're out of the truth, the tr what I might call the truth game, or they're out of the pursuit of truth. You're in pursuit of truth. God bless you. It's make, I'm sure that in one way or another, it's making life pretty uncomfortable for you. You're having to swim against the stream. You don't want to go downriver over the waterfall, which you can hear in the distance, despite the noise that everybody makes to try to drown the sound of the waterfall. You can hear something in your soul is telling you that's the way of destruction and eternal damnation. I do not want to go over that waterfall. I do not want when I die to go to hell. That's an inspiration of God, if that's the way you think. But, but don't think that there's none of that left in the novice order. I, okay, you raise the question of, of novice order ordinations. You, you wonder if they're even valid. I understand perfectly. But go into the question and you will see that it depends upon form, matter, mm -hmm. intention, and minister. Okay. Um, matter is the, the presumably the, 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 la the laying on of two hands on the head. That shouldn't normally be missing. Shouldn't normally be missing. The devil will make it miss if he can. So again, you've got to check on that. The form, it's, it's practically the, the strict form, which is just one or two sentences, or often just one sentence. In this case, it may be two sentences, one or two sentences. The strict form is hardly changed in Latin from the original strict form. There's just an, uh, an et instead of an ut, which actually means that you've got a double request instead of a request and a purpose clause. So a double request is stronger than a request and a purpose clause. So you can say that the new form in Latin is actually stronger than the new form, uh, uh, than the old form in Latin. So that, that's the form. The intention. Now that's getting dubious. Who knows whether the bishop was intending to make a sacrificing priest or a Eucharistic um, a picnic master. Of the, <laughs> the two things are not the same. Of course not. It's perfectly possible that there are bishops who want seriously to make uh, picnic, masters of the picnic and not sacrificing ministers. And I would challenge that it's pretty much all of them. I don't know. You could be right. If you're right, then if the, if the bishops, if the modern bishops are all lacking the true intention, um, then you're right. I don't know. God knows. But in any case... Um, it's possible that there are bishops who still want to do the right thing. I think there are bishops who still want to do the right thing. If you give me strong indications that there are no such bishops left, I will give way to your evidence. And my mind is open and it, my mind is ready to bend one way or the other according to the evidence. If you provide me with the evidence, the evidence the outward signs that these bishops no longer have the right mm -hmm. inward intention are go along with what you say. And in that case, then indeed you shouldn't be, you should be very careful of novice order priests. But in the meantime, I think subject to correction, subject evidence, that there are still a number of bishops who've got the old fashioned idea of what they're doing when they ordain a priest. And then yeah. you've got the then you've got another point, the minister. Is, has the bishop himself been consecrated really? Now, this is a key point, because if the bishop is fake, then of course he can't make, yes. uh, make the priests. No question about it. Is the bishop fake or not? So we come back to the consecration of a bishop. We go straight to the form and matter of the consecration of a bishop. Which also is it's, dubious. It's more dubious than, than, the, than the priestly, priestly ordination. The new right of consecration is more dubious than the new right of ordination. Okay? Yes. And I say that kind of against myself, but, but we're getting into the evidential questions. We're getting into the objective theology of the sacraments, mm -hmm. which is objective. I didn't invent the sacraments. I didn't invent the new right. I didn't invent the old right. I'm not talking about things coming out of my head. I'm, sort of thing, I'm talking about things that are coming into my head, which I'm learning about. Okay. 
Now, the consecration of a bishop is more dubious because the strict form is just two words, receive, or three words, receive the principal spirit. I think that's the um, attribute spiritum principale. I think that's the, if my memory is not betraying me, that is, now, receive the principal spirit is ambiguous. What is the principal spirit? The, the spirit of a prince. Now, the bishops are, it's true, princes of the church. But who's going to make that connection with the word principal? Who's going to connect principal with prince? And who's going to say principal meant prince and prince means bishop? It's ambiguous. It's clearly ambiguous. But read Michael Davis's the new um, what's it the Order of Melchizedek, which is a book he wrote some time ago, precisely about the new rite of ordination. And you will learn there's a Catholic doctrine in Catholic doctrine. There's a, 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 a in Catholic theology. There's a doctrine of de terminatio ex adjunctis, which means that the immediate consequence, the immediate environment, or the immediate surrounds can settle an ambiguity. Mm -hmm. Determination by the adjoined. Determinatio ex adjunctis in Latin, meaning that the immediate context settles an ambiguity. Okay, now, in the new rite of consecration of a bishop, you've almost immediately got the word bishop. B-I-S-H-O-P, Episcopus. That's as clear as clear can be. And it's right next to the ambiguous formula. Remember this. The Freemasons who changed these rites, Bonini at their head, were criminals. Yes. How did they operate? Did they make the new sacraments obviously invalid? No. What did they do? They played, they didn't drive the new sacraments immediately into invalidity. It would have been too gross and the new, the, the new religion would not have passed. The new religion could not have deceived a number of good Catholics who were deceived as it was when they accepted, the, when they went along, when they decided, they studied the question, they decided they would go along with the new religion of Paul VI because they were deceived. Because the new religion of Paul VI was very cleverly designed to be ambiguous, to dance on the edge of invalidity, but not to topple over obviously and clearly into invalidity. So, principal spirit is dancing on the edge of invalidity, but in the immediate context, Bishop, you can look all, look, look, look all this up for yourself. Get into these questions, because that, get, into, get into the objective heart of these questions, which is often Catholic theology, and see what the, old, what the church always used to say for centuries yes. and centuries. And, centuries. and, and I... I, I... I tried my best to do it, Your Excellency, and I have reached a conclusion. And my conclusion is, I can only receive, uh, I can only receive sacraments from a priest who, you know, obviously is validly ordained and so on. And, and I hold that it needs to be in the old rite, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but also, does not impose heresy on me. I, mean, I think there is good evidence for that that he needs not to impose heresy upon me. And so, in that, in that, in that That's scenario. Right. In that scenario, there is just nowhere for me to go, objectively speaking. And if I, if I may also okay. comment on what you not, I'm not sure. Have you, have you looked in, around in your diocese, either for somewhere where the old mass is said by an old priest, for instance, they could still exist. They're dying out, but they could still exist. They did for a long time still exist. And it was to those priests to, that the, the good sheep of our Lord resorted during the 70s, 80s, 90s, 20s, 21s, yes. that, that's where they went. And it's very reasonable, now 22s. Um, they said they were not completely abandoned by Almighty God. They could not complain that they being completely abandoned. They had to take more trouble, yes. They had to maybe have 300 miles to get, what, at least once a month, as Archbishop Lefebvre said. Better to go once a month to the true Mass than to go every Sunday to the false Mass. That's what he said. And uh, th therefore, if you had looked around, if you look around even today, you may still find some of those old centers. But you will also find, I, t I say to you, I do declare, I do believe, if you look around, you will find a network of young priests, a, a, an underground network maybe, but you will tap into it somewhere. You will meet somewhere. Somebody says, go to go and see so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, he will shut the doors. He will turn off all the microphones. 
he will hunt down all of the secret devices. <laughs> <laughs> secret devices planted in your room to yeah. find out what you're up to. Uh, he will, and when, then when he thinks he's in complete privacy, he will tell you what he really thinks. And you may find that what he really thinks is he's got to celebrate the true mass, and he celebrates it. Maybe once a week in his cellar or in his in his atomic bunker. I don't know, <laughs> but I'm sure you will get on the track in your state, if not in your diocese. Yeah. Your Excellency, it's funny, I live in the East Midlands, it's funny you should say that, so I travel to um, uh, pretty much the closest city to me uh, where there is, uh, you know, an SSPX mass, basically, and that was uh, uh, Leicester, and so, uh, uh, you know, I arrived there and uh, basically after looking around, I've uh, contacted the uh, the priest who was uh, celebrating mass once again. I'm saying these things. There are very, there are many nuances here. I wouldn't even say it's celebrating mass. Maybe, maybe not. But you know, for, let's let's let go of the technicalities. Okay, he's celebrating mass. Okay, and so um, he, I think he's the district superior for Great Britain. I can't remember what what his name is. I know who you're talking about. Go on. Yes, and and I've had a contact um, uh, with him. I've spoken to him on the phone, uh, and then afterwards I sent him him an email talking about exactly that. I said, you know, the I know that the SSPX does not uh, approve of the positions that I hold, which are namely, for example, that outside the church there is no salvation, uh, or you know that the, the Pope is not uh, that you know Francis is the Pope, and so on. And I said to him, you know, I was honest. I said. I've got nowhere to go. Will you impose upon me uh, having to believe these things? And I've heard no reply since, even though he was replying to me uh, beforehand. So <laughs> this is kind of the thing that I'm uh, uh, that I'm that I'm having to face. But g generally speaking, you know, from what you've been saying, and it's exactly what you mentioned in your conversation with um, Doctor Jones. It's exactly what you've uh, alluded to before you started talking about this, which is. Charity. I think. I think you're excellent. With all due respect, you're being very charitable. And to me, it just what I see in my in my mind's eye. I say I see Vatican II. I see hijacked council. I see people turned priests around. I see people removed altars. They removed tabernacles. They put okay. tables on. They okay. turned us into quasi Protestants or attempted to. Uh, they've taken out the ancient language of 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 the church, namely the Latin and the Roman Rite. Uh, they uh, people who go to those uh, uh, to those masses in the vast majority of cases they're of the liberal mindset. They go into the church, they come out, they answer a survey, and they say abortion is acceptable in some circumstances. Uh, this uh, homosexuality is acceptable. This is acceptable. Um, you, uh, Your Excellency, are asking me to ponder in this heresy, in this just absolute cesspool of heresy, in order to try to maybe find some priest, which I don't even think that it that he exists, to listen to my confession. But to me, it is so obvious that this whole thing is fake. How can I participate in it? It's fake. This has nothing to do with Vatican I. It's got nothing to do with the teachings of Pius X. It's got nothing to do with Pius IX. It has nothing with to, to do with Thomism. It's Protestantism and Communism. So how can I even approach this as an honest Catholic or try to be an honest Catholic? Understand. The, the Americans have a good, good saying, and it is, if it walks like a duck, if it quacks mm -hmm. like a duck, if it waddles like a duck, it is a duck. So if it talks like a Protestant, if it believes like yeah. a Protestant, if it behaves in church like a Protestant, it is a Protestant. Okay, yes, 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 yes. I understand totally where you're coming from. I only say... I think there's a little more white around you and available if you look for it than you believe. Mm. And I'm saying, and you remember what I said first of all, I said, firstly, pray 15 missions a day of the Holy Rosary. Yes. Then Our Lady will give you some light. And it will be an absolute demonstration of your goodwill to Almighty God. And if you have goodwill, you can, make sh you can be absolutely sure God will not abandon you. And God will lead you. And it's very easy. You, you get on a plane to Croatia, and sitting mm -hmm. right next to you is an, is an ancient priest who, who gives, you, gives you light and consolation and truth uh, but because he's sitting next to you. I mean, I don't know. Almighty God has a thousand ways of getting through to souls. The, the essential thing is goodwill, but, the, but not only goodwill, 
good intelligence. You do need definitely to clean out your mind, yes. But don't, when it comes to applying the principles, don't believe that you're up against a world in which everything is either black, well, I'm sorry, everything in which all of the gray is, is in all black. No, if it's gray, then there's some white mixed in with the black. It's your business to sort out the white from the black, to frequent the white, as you say, not to frequent the black, not to go along with the black, not to go along with these fake religions. You're quite right, you say. The new religion of Vatican II is a fake religion. No question about it. And it's a war with the true religion. I'm obviously not saying going along, go along with the new religion. What I'm saying is I do believe in the terrible mixture of gray and black that exists in this veil of tears that is almost, almost everywhere in this veil of tears. There's no good person in whom there's no bad to be found. There is no bad person in whom there's no good to be found. All persons in this real life, all concrete persons, are some mixture of good and some mixture of bad. That's, that's how things are. And I don't think that um, Almighty God owes to us. He, he, wants us to, he wants us to look for him. He wants us to show that we really care about him. And therefore, the, the searching is not going to be all that easy. Uh, because the more and the more difficult it is, the more we prove that we care for what he is and what he stands for. But it's still there. And therefore, I don't believe in Sadie Vacantism because uh, they, do you know, where Sadie Vacantism finishes in home alone. That is to say, on Sunday, I'm not going to go to Mass anywhere to any priest because all priests are fake, because all of the new religion is fake, because the Pope has been fake ever since Vatican II. Those are, those are true propositions in their way. They're exaggerations, perhaps, but they're, they're, there's truth in all of those propositions. And then I'm persuaded, the devil persuades me, the devil doesn't care which way I fall. He doesn't care whether I exaggerate to the left or the right. The important thing for the devil is that I exaggerate, that I push things too far. So, uh, I'm not, I wouldn't say you're, you're pushing things much too far. I think you, the trouble you're taking in organizing these programs, uh, these video programs, I mean, I think it's uh, it's admirable. You're certainly looking for the truth. Um, I think you are not trusting in the sacred heart that he's leaving enough truth around for sheep to find if they really want if they really want to look for it. Now you say that the novice order is all completely gone and rotten. I understand, and you can't afford to eat a half-poisoned cake. I understand. But if the cake is half-poisoned, then there's half of it it isn't poisoned. And if you're using your mind, the point comes when you can begin to distinguish between what is poison and what isn't. So when you come to applying, these, the principles are absolute, but their application is in, the principles are in black and white, with no mixture. But the application is in a world of graves. So when it comes to applying the principles, you've got to, uh, you, you accuse me of being too charitable. You may be right. I'm not saying you're wrong. I don't try. It's not that I'm trying to be charitable. I'm trying to think how Almighty God, how the Sacred Heart cares for all these sheep, that, that many of whom have been misled without their own fault. Yes. You're, he, cares, I, he cares for them. For instance, I'll give you a clear and classic example. Yes. Um, do there exist Eucharistic miracles in the world of the new mass? Some people would say absolutely not. Impossible. Every new mass is invalid automatically, in principle. I know it. And I cannot go anywhere near it. Well, I cannot go anywhere near it may be true. But, but that there is nothing of God still there, that there's no validity still there, may well not be true. And the reality, one moment, the historical reality, the objective reality, is that these miracles do continue in with the new mass. Now, how can that be if the new rite, the new ordination of priests, and the new consecration of bishops is also fake? Uh, we're, up against, we're up against a question of evidence. Do modern minds still run on evidence? Or do they just run on emotion? Now, I'll give you an example of evidence. In 2008, you may have heard of these stories. In 2008, there was allegedly a miracle, a Eucharistic miracle, 
in the uh, town of Sokulka in eastern Poland. Okay. Um, the miracle was that a, ho a host dropped to the floor, a consecrated host was being mm -hmm. dropped to the floor. It was picked up uh, correctly by the sister. She correctly put it in a glass of water and put the glass of water in a cabinet in the sacristy. That's exactly what the church normally does. Normally, at the end of the week, the host is dissolved in the water and the sister then takes it outside and, and sprinkles the water on the, the water with the dissolved host on the grass of Mother Earth. That would be entirely correct. In this case, she goes to the, the cabinet after a week and finds that the host is still not dissolved and that part of it is red, got turned red. This is 2008 with many witnesses that you could still meet in a town in the east of Poland. You can catch a plane to Poland, you can go to this parish, you can find the people that were knew about it at the time, and they can tell you exactly what they saw. At that point, you're entitled to believe them or not to believe them, up to you. Okay, I went to Sokolka precisely to find out what happened, and etc., etc., etc. I met the parish priest, priest who, who received myself and my two friends very kindly. Somebody else was interpreting for me, and his daughter came along, so there were three of us. He received us very kindly. He answered all my questions. I said, "What were you at this? Uh, were you there at this time? Yes. Were you the parish priest at this time? Yes. Did you see this uh, host? Yes. And the host is now enshrined in the church for everybody to adore. It's a Novus Ordo church. It's a Novus Ordo diocese. It's a Novus Ordo parish. It's the new church. But here it is. Here is the adoration of a host which." according to a mass of the evidence, is a real host. Let me tell you a little more about this host. This host, um, she goes back a week and, and the parish priest says, sister, put it away for another week. They put it away for another week and the, and the red has, has simply expanded one, one, one week later. They call in the bishop and I think, maybe in the bishop, I don't remember exactly all the details, but the district bishop, probably on the decision of the bishop, a, a sample, a little sample is sent to a local laboratory, scientific laboratory. The Poles are not idiots. They're not Germans, but they're not idiots. I mean, Germans would have a very exact science and so on and so on and so on. But the Poles have got decent laboratories and decent hospitals, decent scientists. And the report, the report comes back, this is human flesh, the red thing is human flesh, it's the flesh of a man under great stress from the muscle around the heart. These are experts in analysis and diagnosis and so on and so on. They know what they're talking about and this is their objective dis observation. What? What? It's from the muscle of the heart around the heart of a man under great stress. What's more? It, it, a piece of flesh normally separated from the human body, the white corpuscles die within half an hour. The white corpuscles in this piece of flesh are living. It's an exceptional piece of flesh. What's more, the flesh is so inter intertwined, it's not the twined is the wrong word, interconnected, interbuilt with the, what's still bred in the host, I was, I'm sorry, with what is still according to the appearances bred, because of course the, the, the whole thing has been, if, you see, if it's been validly consecrated, the whole thing is, um, uh, is the body of Christ. So I can't talk about bread, but, but the appearances of bread. The appearances of bread are so closely intermeshed with the appearances of flesh that it couldn't have been faked by human hand, could not have been faked, fabricated by human hand. That's this laboratory. Yes, and I, I understand that, Your Excellency. I would say multiple things uh, that it's simply, to me, that simply is just not good enough to excuse all of this, what's going on. I'm not excusing. No, 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 I, and I'm not saying that, that you are, I'm just saying that it could be, there could be some other explanation, uh, you know. Come on, be fair. I'm obviously not pushing the new religion. No, no, of what course I'm not. Saying, what I'm saying is, that there is still part valid in the new religion alongside all that is fake. I may well admit readily, even readily, that in many cases there's much more fake than there still is validity. 
That's not the question. The question is what you should do where you are. And have you got to absolutely stay away from anything that's got anything to do with the novice order? My answer to that absolute question is no, you don't have to stay absolutely away. I'm not saying follow the, old, the new religion. I'm saying with a bit of detective work and with a bit of, a bit of perseverance, you, you've got, you're, you're young and you're strong, you can drive around the diocese and that priest, that you, the SSBX priest, probably knows some conservative priests in, in the area, probably. Ask him. Some conservative priests may well have got, got in touch with him to, and stay in touch with him because the SSBX is, is playing the part in today's church of providing at least a serious contact with the true and old religion. Well, speaking of the SSPX, Your Excellency, that's where I actually wanted to go to. Um, is uh, is I wanted to kind of find out find out more about a cone and find out more about um, Archbishop Lefebvre. And I don't know if you if you know Father An Anthony Chicada, who's passed away uh, recently. He was well, he was also, of course, yes. So I wanted to ask about that. He um, in his videos that he's made, he was talking about uh, the different. Mm, uh, let's say uh, camps that formed at a kind the more traditionally minded kind of uh, pseudo sedes right and then and then the people who wanted kind of reconciliation with this new it, church gray gray what surprises you that acorn was filled with grays no 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 i i just wanted to uh, ask what what was the what was the atmosphere did you uh there was much debate uh, about oh. sedevacantism and and all of that oh boy I was there from Arikon itself from 72 to 76. There was a left-wing crisis in 1973. Mm -hmm. There was a left-wing crisis in 1975. There was a left-wing crisis in 1977. There was a right-wing Sadivac crisis in 1979. This was after I'd left Arikon, but mm -hmm. I was still in Switzerland and still around, so to speak. You know, the devil was shaking it from, from, from day one. Every single seminary of the Society of Vice the Tenth got shook, shook up, got all shook up by the devil and by his minions because the devil hated what the Archbishop was doing. Does that mean that, that, that you know, that Acon is no good? That Acon, that Acon, Acon shook up the devil, which is why the devil counterattacked big time. And I swear, when I say big time, I yeah. mean big time. Um... I went through two of those, at least two of those crises, and they, they shook the seminary. What can you, but the devil was doing his job, mm -hmm. which means that there was something was going on that he did not like. Does that mean that the whole of Echo was black? <laughs> Obviously, it proves the opposite. There was something so white that the devil was on its track big time. Life is gray. Yes. This veil of tears is full of gray. Black is not white, white is not black, but life is grey. The veil of tears is grey, because the devil got in with Adam and Eve through Satan, and he's been there ever since. And we're all of us riddled with original sin. We're all of us set, marinated in original sin. It's very sad. We're all sinners. Very sad. It's very unpleasant. It's very naughty. But what do you, what do you think? Our Lord came to save sinners. He didn't come to save the, the just. He said it. So you know you're going to be surrounded by sinners and, you, and everything you run into is going to be riddled with sin. If it's human, it's going, it's going to be sin involved. What do you expect? Yes, uh, it's, uh, I mean, I just wanted to... Um, uh, well, it's right to insist in matters of religion, you don't want to mix black with white. Yes. Completely agreed. You're absolutely right. The true church does not. The true church is white as driven snow. Yes. And that's, that's the true church. But the real church is, consists of human beings who are not white as driven snow. They've got the, every single one of these popes, of these cardinals, of these bishops, of these priests, has got original sin in them. What do you expect? So they, they, these, these, these ministers of God, at their best, they try for what, everything that's white. And they, they declare, we're in for white and we're not in for black. You can't get to heaven with black. If necessary, you're going to have to, the last black is going to have to be purged out of you in purgatory. 
But if you want to get to heaven, you've got to pursue the white and shun the black until the day you die. And that's, that's real. And if you want to keep your head above the swirling waters of confusion, in today's ocean of confusion, the ocean is infuriated, it's being whipped up by winds and tempests. If you want to keep your head above waters, pray 15, 1, 5 mysteries every day of the Holy Rosary. That's a serious recommendation. And that, you, that recommendation you can take 100%. The recommendation to look around you inside the Novus Ordo Church for people or occasional churches where you might dare to try practicing confession or communion, um, that is not 100%. That's, that's dependent upon the, the degree of sin raging in the diocese around you, in the, ch in the poor churchmen. Even with, even with the novice of the church, one may have a certain compassion. Not with the villains who know exactly what they're doing in, in destroying the church, mm. but, but with the mass. Because the priests have been mis misled as well, for goodness sakes. And the bishops have been misled. The Pope is now ramming down all of his bishops' throats, stamp out the old religion. How can, how can the true bishop... Do you think all of the bishops go along with that? Well, insofar as continuing to be calling Pope and being a part of all this charade, they are. But of course, I think deep down, some of them are just in horror. There you are. And those in horror, as I say, they switch off all the listening devices in their presbytery, but they will tell you privately that they are in horror. They can't stand what's going on. There are many such priests. I do believe there are many such priests in the Lord's order. And more and more young priests who have known nothing of tradition. The Spirit of God is still moving over the waters, and the Spirit of God is still at work, even in this rotten church. God has not abandoned his church. He's abandoned a number of churchmen, yes, and they're heading straight for hell, and they're taking a number of souls with them, just like Our Lady of Garabandal said in the 1960s, at the time of Vatican II. But... The, the, that's not that's not everywhere the case. And you ask the, you ask me the practical question: How can I go to confession? How can I go to communion? I think it's easier to go to confession to find confession than to find a communion which we rely on, because the new, the novice of the mass is a falsification of the of the central act of worship of man towards God, which is the the true mass, of course. Anyway, don't let me push you away from your pursuit of, of the absolute truth, and, but do, do think. No, no, you've do given me a lot of questions that I'm, I'm kind of currently pondering, and I will be for a while. Uh, so that's exactly why I'm doing these. I think there are a lot of people, and I can tell you, Your Excellency, uh, there is, once again, we have to talk about uh, terminology here, conservatives, right? So there are a lot of young traditionally minded, shall we say, young men across the United States, across Europe, more so in the US, but in an increasing amount in Europe as well, who are facing the same issues. They're facing the same issues. So that's exactly why I'm trying to arrange these conversations with people like you to try to get the insight that we need to survive in this. You know, that's kind of the, that's kind of the purpose. Um, I understand very well. And uh, uh, just uh, some questions from uh, from listeners. Uh, thank you, Anonymous, for supporting uh, the conversation. Martin uh, Snig has also supported the conversation, and he's asked, has Bishop Williamson seen the beating heart of Jesus' Eucharistic miracle very recently in uh, uh, Gua Guadalajara? Is that right? In Mexico, I believe. I think that's right. Yes. I haven't seen it, but I can easily believe in it. I'm not one of those that say it's the novice order, it can't be true. I don't say that. Is it true? I would need to study what people say about it, who says what, who's seen what mm. happened. I'd need to go into the evidence to say whether I thought it was true or not, but I can easily believe it's true. I do not exclude a priori by principle and beforehand, but before looking at the evidence, I don't say it cannot be true. It might be fake for a moment. Mother Church is very slow in studying these cases and very careful to say that she thinks it's true. But they can be true. In other words, Almighty God, the Sacred Heart of Jesus, is warning the priests who are very careless with the, with the, with the, the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. Watch, my children. Watch out. 
my pre my preferred sons, my my favorite sons, you you and the, my priesthood. Remember what you're doing when you consecrate. Think what you're doing when you consecrate. Don't treat my my hosts like food for the dogs. I beg of you, you will you're you're on the path to the depths of hell if you do that. That's part of what he's doing with these miracles. It's an appeal to the priests. Amongst other things, I would say that's almost the first thing he's doing, trying to remind the priests of what they're, what, what they're handling so carelessly, how carelessly they're, going, they're, they're behaving with, these, with, with, with his consecration, with his consecration. When he consecrates a host, it's a very serious business. Obviously, it's a product of his men, it's a product of his love. But what are we human beings do, doing with the love of God? My favorite sons, think before you die. Repent before you die. The way I see these, uh, in my mind, the way I see these miracles, if, let's say, you know, they are true, um, well, I'm, I'm kind of reminded of two things. First of all, uh, that God can always work his will. And I'm sh of course, he understands the kind of situation we're in. And he understands the, the hearts of the, the priests, of each individual one, understands the hearts of the people, and, and obviously has the perfect knowledge of the context. And he may intervene in, 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 in separate cases. Uh, there is, uh, you know, that, that is quite obvious to me. The second point that is... Uh, that, that I'm thinking about is once again going back to the Great Western Schism. After the schism, you know, there there's the the, the question of, so yes, we had, uh, you know, who was the Pope, and then then we had the person who was the anti-Pope, and obviously he's made bishops who were not real bishops, objectively speaking, and these bishops made, objectively speaking, people who are not priests, priests, and and then they would uh, of course celebrate the mass. So does that mean that all these people who were under the wrong uh, pope at the time, right, uh, in in France, shall we say, uh, were committing idolatry? And the church afterwards said, in fact, no. Uh, the The church has um, uh, the church has kind of understood the the situation and made a disposition in that case, uh, in a case of extreme crisis, to uh, you know, to make sure that. Uh, the people are actually receiving the valid, uh, the valid sacraments. So I think perhaps a one of those two things, or a combination of those two things, may end up being the truth for our the truth for our crisis as well. Um, let's see. I don't know what you think of that. If you wanted to respond to that, yeah, of course. When wicked men mess around with the church, Mother Church, the true Mother Church, has to clean up the mess afterwards. And when you say Mother Church has made dispositions in these cases, you're talking about mother, how Mother Church, back in the uh, same Mother Church, having recovered her sanity, dealt with these cases. Mother Church is going to have a hell of a job cleaning up the mess of Vatican II, but it will do it. I don't know how it will do it. It may declare, I don't know how Mother Church will do it. I do know that Mother Church will do it. It will clean up the mess. So do, do you not think that we are in, effectively, the end times? Do you believe that or not? We are at the end of the times, but it's not yet the end of the world, but it's coming close to the end of the world. We're at the end of the fifth age of the church. There's still the sixth age to go, which is a great triumph of the Immaculate Mary, and then there is the corruption and the arrival of the Antichrist, and the corruption of the best is the worst. The... the um, the, 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 the triumph of Mary will be a golden age of the church, the golden age of the church, the greatest triumph of the church over the whole, over the, over the entire world. And the corruption of that glorious time will be the most terrible corruption of all, which will be the Antichrist. We might be, I don't, don't make me say I'm things that I'm not saying. We, I'm not saying we are 60 years away from the end of the world. Mm -hmm. I, it might be about 60 years. It would be definitely more than six years, definitely less than 600 years. But I do think we are approaching the end of the world, yes. Only not yet immediately. Yes. What we're going through, well, I think that what we're going through is the dress rehearsal for the end of the world. Which, which great, as, as the dress rehearsal closely resembles the, the first performance, so the dress rehearsal today close resembles the corruption of the end of the world, but it's not yet the end of the world. Understood. 
Um, another question comes from a supporter, Rogelio uh, Cabarello. He asks, um, question for Bishop Williamson. What do you think uh, of Rama Kumaraz uh, Wemi's work on the validity of Novus Ordo Episcopal consecrations? Reference book, The Anglican Drama. Go. I'm sorry, I don't know the book. I re met in the United States years and years ago, once or, tw once or twice, Dr. Kumaraswamy. Um, he is much respected by the state of Kansas because he takes root and tootin', mm -hmm. root and tootin', knock down, drag out positions, which are fair enough. They emphasize the truth. They emphasize the need of truth. Um, the state of Kansas have, have got a point. They, they, they try to be logical. They've got the faith. They've got, they've got virtues. But I think they lose their balance. I think they lose the whole picture. And if I read the book of Dr. Krumo Swami, Probably, I would think he was giving just one side of the story. <coughs> and, I say, and I suggest to you that, that when Sedevacantism gets pushed and pushed to its final conclusion, it means people who just c completely give up on any priest at all and stay at home on Sundays, home alone. And that's dangerous. They're, lying, they're sitting ducks for the devil. If they don't receive the sacraments, and if they don't believe the sacraments are still continuing, they can they can end up in all kinds of nonsense. Be careful. Mm -hmm. The devil is very cunning. Yeah. But he doesn't mind. I think it's Chesterton who said he doesn't mind which way we fall. If you point up your point your in, in the index finger at the, at the ceiling, uh, there's 360 degrees all around your index finger, and he doesn't mind if you fall that way, that way, this way, that way. Just as long as we fall, to him it's the same. There's one there's one position in which you can stand, and the rest is falling. And that one position is the balance of truth. Truth is not true because it's balanced, but when truth is true, it is balanced, because usually it can be exaggerated in either of two directions. Personally, I believe that pseudo-mechanism is an exaggeration, which is potentially dangerous. The terrible thing about Sede is, is that people's minds tend to sh say that the minds of Sede tend to shut tend to shut down. I don't say they always shut down, but I say they tend to shut down because there's a good deal of emotion in Sede Vacantism. I cannot bear the torture of this terrible situation for church. Sede Vacantism is a simple solution. These popes are not popes. Whew, I'm out of my agony. Sede Vacantism takes me out of my agony. But I'm not going to go back and question it again because I'll be going back into agony. Therefore, I'm going to stay with Sadio Kansism. And I'm not going to listen to the opposite arguments. And people lose their minds. Their minds cease to function, except to defend Sadio that's, that's, I It's not a good sign, let's just say. Maybe the reason I lean that way, Your Excellency, is because, well, I'm a mathematician by education. And so, to me, to me, I see, I read dogma, I read, like, you know, this sentence, this sentence, uh, solemnly well, approved, I, therefore... When you, say, when you say you've been a student of mathematics, you tend to give yourself away. Because, of course, mathematicians like 2 plus 2 equals 4. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, sure. And you can prove a number of the things that you say, and you expect proof, and you mm -hmm. expect Euclidean style proof. I expect QED, Your Excellency. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Which is, in mathematics, is fair enough. But Aristotle wisely says you cannot demand of any subject more certainty than it can provide. History is not a certain science. But dogma is, isn't it, Your Excellency? Well, to a considerable extent, yes. But on the other hand, you've got to allow in dogma for mystery. Dogma is, uh, is God's truths. And that the Pope today really is Pope, it's, if it's true. I'm not, say, I'm not saying Francis is certainly Pope. I believe the arguments against his being Pope are serious. I've not gone into the question so as to read mm -hmm. all of Father Kramer's books, for instance. But um, I respect what is what his stand which is that, you know, these, these popes are just too bad possibly to be pope. <laughs> but on the other hand, um, the, other, the opposite emotional truth is that um, the pope is too important to the church for, for 40 years, what is it now, since Vatican II, 60 years, what is it now, uh, 
70 years, isn't it? For 65 to 22 is 65 to 25 would be. Uh, well, it's about 57 years since 1965. Okay, there we are then. 57 years. The the the, the church is too dependent upon the pope. This is a, a an opposite emotional truth. The pope is too dependent upon the church is too dependent on the pope to be able to do without a valid pope for 73 years. For what did you say? 53, 57 years. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you've got emotion on both sides. Yes. So to, speak. Yeah. to me, it just does not. Uh, I do not feel any emotion. You know, when I read these documents from the old popes, like there is no emotion to me. You know, I read. You need to hold all the truths, holy and violet. Okay, I take this with a cold head, with a totally cold head. And then I read all the dogmas that are inf I know are infallible because Vatican I taught us that, and you know, for the ones that were, for example, declared by the popes. And it just seems to me this is this is Catholicism, right? This is like. This is historical Catholicism, you know, the Pope says solemnly this, that means it's true, and therefore there is no deviation from it. That's just, that's my mind, you know, and there's no emotion in it. Uh, it's just, if then, you know, that's... Well, for, for a number of sanctifications, believe me, there is emotion in it. Okay, okay. But in any case, um, also, Vatican I said, there will always be a Pope. I do believe it said something like, there will always be a Pope. I'm not, I don't believe that was one of the infallible canons. But it did say that in the paragraphs, I think, around the canons. You know, the canons, the church sets up, frames a canon before it defines a canon. So it says what the canon is saying, what the canon is not saying, then it says the canon. So I think the, the, in, in the framing of one of the canons, is, I think Vatican I said that there will always be a pope. Well, on that issue, actually, it's interesting because Archbishop Lefebvre has spoken on this. He was asked this hypothetical question, um, might have been during the, uh, the uh, as you put it, right-wing Sede crisis, and he was asked, theoretically, you know, what if effectively the Sedes were right? It wasn't put that way, but theoretically, what if every pope, you know, since has been a heretic and therefore was not able to be Pope, was able, not able to hold office, what would happen? And to me, he said something which I've already come to a very simple conclusion in my mind, is that, well, we have periods with no Pope already, all the time, you know, in between the deaths of the Pope. And he said exactly the same thing. In that theoretical scenario, we would be at in the same situation where the last Pope has died, and therefore, you know, therefore, and something comes out of that. But that's the situation. And I tend to agree with him on that. Yeah, well, it's, um, I've not gone into it really seriously. Mm. Understandable, uh, understandable. Um, another supporter, seminarian in exile. Your Excellency, I'm a diocesan seminarian in the US. You are correct that there are more and more young men attracted to the old right, even though it is not permitted where we study. What advice can you give to seminarians of goodwill in diocesan seminaries? Fifteen mysteries a day of the Holy Rosary. Semper idem, always the same recipe. I, 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 if, if I recommend that they put themselves in the hands of the Blessed Virgin Mary, she cannot mislead them. I could mislead. But Archbishop Lefebvre couldn't mislead him. I don't think he did do much misleading, if, if any. He, he did a remarkably little quantity of misleading, if any. But uh, he, he's got original sin, I've got original sin. Uh, I don't believe in human, the infallibility of human ministers. Popes, the, the infallibility of popes is very strictly defined, as I'm sure you should know. As I'm, sure, I'm not sure you've understood, but I'm sure you should know. It depends absolutely on the pope speaking as pope. Yes. With the morals, with the intention to bind the whole church in a definitive fashion. As yes, pastor of all Christians, yes. All conditions which must absolutely be fulfilled mm -hmm. before the Holy Ghost, the assistance of the Holy Ghost is guaranteed to protect from a mistake. Um, so the infallibility of the church is very strictly limited mm -hmm. to only when the church, the Pope is, is teaching highest octane, so to speak. It's only when he's teaching at the full stretch of his powers that he is going to be protected by the church. Anything less than that, you're going to be protected by the Holy Spirit. Anything less than that, and he is open to error. 
So the church itself is saying the Pope can make the Pope can make mistakes, except under these conditions. I don't think Pope Francis is anywhere near any time engaged all four conditions. And what um, the Archbishop used to say was that these are liberals who don't believe in infallibility. If they mm -hmm. don't believe in infallibility, how can they practice infallibility? No, Vatican II, you know, that, that it, directly, uh, uh, it directly repudiated Vatican I, effectively speaking. Well, the, the Vatican, Vatican II is not infallible except when it's repeating truths that have been true down, and known to be true and said to be true, down centuries of, 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 Catholic, of church history. Then, then Vatican II was infallible because it was repeating what's already infallible. But whenever in Vatican II was inventing something new, it was absolutely not infallible. That, that makes sense. Um, I, I think uh, I don't want to hold you for too much longer, Your Excellency. We have been going for quite quite a while, and I thank you for this great opportunity. I hope you enjoyed uh, speaking with uh, Dr. Jones and myself. Um, and uh, just a last few, uh, last few notes. What do you think is in the future for uh, Francis? Where do you see where do you see his leadership ending? How do you see it developing? What, what's what's going to happen in, in his church? I'm afraid he's going to persevere all the way to death. Death may not be far off. He's had serious troubles in his insides, not just with a hip joint or, or something, but with his insides, which are a matter of life and death. Is in a, being in a road chair with a knee problem is not a matter of life and death, but uh, his insides are. He had a serious operation, um, oh, I don't know how many, several months, six, nine months ago. Uh, he's going to die, like all of us, but I don't think he will change course before he dies. I don't think. I don't think he will convert. It would be an absolute miracle if he did convert. Mm -hmm. But I think he's going to die as he's lived, which is what happens in most cases. The tree fall lies where it's fallen. Um, he will pass, pass by. Uh, the the conclave will probably elect, I'm afraid, another one like him, and the conciliar church will go on until Almighty God intervenes, in with a chastisement, unlike anything that has ever been seen in all history, including the flood of Noah. Fire is going to fall from heaven, says Our Lady. Said our lady at Akito in Japan in 1973, which is not all that long ago. Um, she said, fire will fall from heaven, um, eliminating a large part of humanity. A lot of people are going to die. And it's not just going to be World War Three. World War Three will look like children's games compared with the fire from heaven. The fire will fall from heaven like Sodom and Gomorrah. And a lot of people will die. And she says, the good with the bad, the priests with the, with the laity, and the survivors will be so desolate that they will uh, envy the dead. At that moment, you will have two weapons, she says. The rosary. That's why I'm one reason why I'm so keen on the rosary. And two, she says, the sign left by my son, which I think is connected to, I think is connected to Garibando, when our Lord is going to leave some special sign uh, at the village behind him. When he, when he works a great miracle in Garibando at an unknown date. Um, that's a, another whole story, uh, but I believe in Garibaldo. Uh, then she says, um, at that moment we've had two weapons, the rosary and the sign left by my son. And she says then, pray the rosary for the Pope, for the bishops and for the priests. That's what she says. That's where the real problem is. That's where the problem of the whole world is, because the church, is the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And when the light goes out, you've got darkness, and when the salt loses its savour, you've got corruption. Because salt used to be the refrigerator, used to be the preserver of foodstuffs before refrigerators. And darkness and corruption is what we've got all around us today. I'm afraid that, given the weakness of human nature, it's only going to increase until the point that Almighty God finally intervenes, then there's going to be tremendous chastisement. Coming out of that chastisement, the survivors will end the dead until the survivors put the world, put church and the world together again. And then there's going to be a golden period, maybe 25 years. 
maybe 30 years, maybe 35 years. But Our Lady said in 1846 in La Salette, another apparition, when she tried to tell the world what was going on, what would happen, she said, 25 years of good harvest, she predicted at La Salette this golden period, which is a which will be the most tremendous triumph of the Catholic Church in all its history, just as today is the most tremendous corruption in all its history. And then the, only the Antichrist is going to be an even worse corruption, but also an even greater triumph of the martyrs who are going to be gigantic heroes of the Church under the, under the Antichrist. It's going to be the most terrible persecution with some of the most glorious martyrs, and then comes the end of the world. Not in 60 years, not in 600, possibly in about 60 years. But it's only a speculation and it's a wide open date. It might, the Almighty God has a very long fuse. He takes a long time before he acts. Watch out when he does act, but don't expect it tomorrow. It may easily be the day after tomorrow or the day after that and so on. I'm sure we have taken a lot from both your conversation with Dr. Jones and our conversation just now. Uh, I'd like to to thank you for coming once again. It was a real honor having you and Dr. Jones. If you want to talk with him again publicly, I'm sure there, you've got a lot to discuss. Uh, feel free to let me know. We can organize these uh, um, at any time when you're free, when he's free. And, uh, you know, it seems like the, the, the top thing, however, that what, what we've learned is for, for people like me, me immortals to do, uh, is to pray the rosary a greatest weapon and and uh, hope to see the greater days for our church. Pray the rosary because human beings can mislead you either into liberalism or into, say, or into let's say, extreme, say, into home alone, into um, total belief in the church, an exaggerated belief in the churchman, an exaggerated disbelief in the church. Those are two extremes. Uh, Our Lady will not mislead anybody who prays her rosary, her complete rosary every day. I can't believe that she will allow any such person to be misled. And that's, she is infallible. So, and we humans are not. Trust in the infallible uh, words of Our Lady. And all of you stay safe. Once again, thank you, uh, Your Excellency, for coming on. Almighty God. Pleasure. Pleasure. Bye-bye.